Hello again, students. This is Dr. Clark. Welcome to the third of our lectures for this half of the semester. <clears throat> I thought instead of starting with our usual prayer, I would share with you a reflection that came through our university emails for Lent by Rebecca Bernard, who works in the Information and Technology Office. She's a Scranton grad from 2001. And I was so struck by this reflection that I thought I would share it with you. And since everything else is upended, I thought I would upend the normal routine of our prayers by reading you her reflection and her prayer at the end of it. It feels like God has hit the pause button on life, and we will likely observe both the good and bad in ourselves as we sit in our homes for an extended period of time. We will see the precious things we have built, the relationships, careers, and businesses, healthy habits, hobbies, and communities of faith and service. But we should also be prepared to notice some things we have built that we're not interested in maintaining. The addictions, distractions, debt, unhealthy lifestyles, and general culture of busyness. As in all times and for all people, Jesus is offering a way out. And it is simple, maybe not easy, but simple. Turn and face him. Look away from all that this world offers, all the shiny things and grandiose promises, and gaze on his face. Let go of our pain, our mistakes, our guilt, our fear, and give them to the one who came to take them from us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, help us turn away from all the distractions of this chaotic world and face the loving face of your Son. Help us let go of the things that we need to let go of and embrace the love you so generously pour into our laps. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so the lecture for today is on the Christological controversies of the early church. But the question that underlies all these controversies is how do Christians understand the relationship between the divinity and humanity of Jesus Christ? How do they understand these two aspects of Jesus' identity, that he's God but also human, fully God and yet fully human? I include on this slide here for you Caravaggio's famous painting, The Doubting Thomas. It's a little bit gross, maybe shocking to you, but I thought it would be a fitting way to begin the lecture because it combines both of these dimensions in one scene. As the picture itself portrays, you have a very physical act going on here. The resurrected Jesus is appearing to the Apostle Thomas, who you may remember doubted whether it could possibly be true that Jesus is indeed alive, that he rose from the dead. And Jesus appears to Thomas, and he shows him his wounds. He shows him the holes in his hands, and he shows them the wound in his side, and he even says, Thomas, place your hands on these wounds. Stick your finger into the wound in my side. Do not doubt any longer, but believe. And you may also remember Thomas's reaction to this invitation. He falls upon his knees and he says, my Lord and my God. It's a nice intersection of the humanity and divinity of Jesus because it's only by engaging in these physical characteristics, indeed by touching them physically, that Thomas comes to make the confession, my Lord and my God, which means that the one who's standing before him, this human being into whose wounds he has just placed his hands and fingers, is the Lord and God that Thomas, as a believing Jew, maintains that created the whole universe. So it's by engaging Jesus' humanity in as physical a way as possible that Thomas comes to confess Jesus' divinity and it's within the context of a personal encounter that he does this. 
So what follows is going to be a very intellectual and conceptual investigation of the relationship between Jesus's divinity and humanity, but we should keep this personal encounter in mind. This is what lies behind all of it, the possibility for this personal encounter and the transforming effects of this personal encounter. Before we do that, though, we should at least lay out the groundwork for the very intelligibility of the incarnation. Is it even possible for us to think about it? Is it something that we can understand? And I thought it would be good to think about the way in which mystery relates to this category of intelligibility. Intelligibility just means able to be understood, that which allows us to understand something. Mystery, as we'll see, does not preclude intelligibility. I made a little Venn diagram here for you to illustrate this. So if we first posit that there's a realm of things that are comprehensible, things that can be completely known, and if we contrast that with its opposite, a realm of things that in and of themselves cannot be known, that are incoherent and therefore completely unknowable, the realm of mystery lies where these overlap. For something to be a mystery isn't for it to just be sheer nonsense, for it just to be arbitrary. It's something that, from our perspective, we cannot completely know, but that we believe is somehow knowable. Something that we can understand in part, but not in full. And so the incarnation would fall into this category. Is it something that is completely incoherent in itself? Well, if so, it makes no sense to ask any questions about it. It's just pure nonsense. It's absurdity. And so it's not something that our mind can even enter into. It's not even something that we can really think about in any meaningful way. But it's also not something that we can completely wrap our heads around either. It's not something that we can comprehend fully. It's not something that is totally accessible to our reason. And so we can't completely integrate it in into the patterns of the natural world. This will be important to remember as we go along. Mystery is something that is intelligible in itself, but not something that is fully comprehensible to us. The second preliminary question to ask is, well, what's at stake in understanding the Incarnation? I mean, why even bother to think about it? Why would Christians especially think it's important to try to work through the relationship between Jesus' divinity and humanity? And we should qualify that by recognizing that, in some sense, this is a secondary consideration, but it's nonetheless very important. The primary consideration, as we mentioned at the beginning, is an individual's encounter with Jesus himself. And as Christians believe, an encounter with Jesus himself is an encounter with God. And it's this encounter that is primary. We may think of the story of the man born blind in John chapter 9, where he is asked by the Jewish religious authorities, how is it that this person, Jesus, was able to cure your blindness? And his answer was, I don't know. But all that I know is that I was blind once and now I can see. What was primary for him was not so much the details and inner workings of his healing, but the encounter with grace and life that he experienced when he encountered Jesus Christ. But given any time, our human reason is going to ask questions about whether or not this encounter is real is true and the way we work through that is by thinking through it to the extent that we can and if we come to see after thinking and reflecting upon an encounter such as this that it seems self-contradictory that it seems to be utterly arbitrary we can begin to imagine maybe this isn't something that ever really happened or maybe it's something 
that it was false or projected, just a product of my imagination. So what's really at stake in understanding the Incarnation is the reality of it. Do Christian beliefs about Jesus point to any reality beyond ourselves? Well, if they don't, if we find upon thinking about this reality that it's just illusory, that it's self-contradictory, that it seems just utterly absurd and incomprehensible, then it can be very easy to think, well, maybe this encounter is really just a product of my own imagination. Is the incarnation something that really I'm just projecting onto the world, or is it really there? If it's really there, it should be able to be understood to some extent. And at the very least, it would not be internally contradictory. It would not reduce to some sort of absurdity, because logically speaking, when something is contradictory, it's reduced to nonsense, to something that really has no meaning, and therefore no external reality, no sign of being independent of my own mind. So on the left, you see a picture here of the Sistine Chapel ceiling painted by Michelangelo, the creation of man. One of the most beautiful things about this, you often see a uh, close-up of the two hands together. I find even more beautiful, though, the faces. That in the creation of man, God is facing the human person, and the human person is able to gaze back at the God who created him. But the question again is, well, are you looking at anything real? Is there anything out there to look at? Or like the painting of Narcissus there on the right, are you just merely seeing a reflection of yourself? Is the incarnation something really out there that I can reflect upon, that I can presume is real, that has a kind of external integrity, independent of my own mind and wishes? Or is it merely just the reflection of my wishes and imaginings? Is it like the reflection of my own mind and hopes and desires that I see out there in the world? <clears throat> but it's not really there. Okay, just a brief review of what we went over last time, what the Catechism says about the reasons why the Word became flesh. And it gave four of them in sections 457 to 460. The first one of which is, the Word became flesh in order to save us by reconciling us with God. Well, in thinking through this, what's at stake is, is the salvation actually real? Is it something out there that can transform me? Uh, if you are sick and you're in need of a vaccine, you presume and certainly hope that the vaccine is actually there. Do you understand how it works? Do you understand how it was made? Maybe, maybe not. But you presume, even if you don't understand it, that it's real and that it works. And so is salvation something that is going to transform me? Is it possible for me to be made right with God? Likewise, the word became flesh to reveal God's love. But again, you could ask, is this love actually out there? Does God really love us? Is this love real? <clears throat> the word became flesh, furthermore, to be our model of holiness. And this raises the question of, well, you see somebody in the world that appears to be whole, appears to be intact, appears to be fully and beautifully human. Is this real? Or is this just a mirage? And finally, the word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. This is perhaps the hardest one to wrap our minds around. What does that even mean? Well, similar to what we talked about with Pascal, this kind of corresponds to an inner desire that human beings have for the infinite and for the fullness of life that Christians call eternal life. Now, these are four reasons. I'm sorry I numbered them one, 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 but uh, uh, you see there, that's just the formatting error. But you see how these four dimensions uh, pose something real for the Christian to believe in, and in thinking through how Jesus' humanity and divinity relate to one another, what's at stake is the reality of those goods that explain the Incarnation. Okay, so what is the teaching on the Incarnation? This is the next uh, subject that the Catechism goes to. 
And it says in section 461 that the Son of God assumed human nature in order to accomplish our salvation. Okay, so this is just sort of a restatement of the first reason given prior. But then it goes on to explain, you might say, the mode or the means for doing this. And it quotes that second chapter of Philippians that Michael Himes quoted at the beginning of his chapter. He emptied himself. Some translations say he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. He came, he came into the world and became one of us, and in doing so, he let go. He poured himself out. This shows us how God came into the world in order to accomplish the salvation. And then it reiterates that belief in the true incarnation of the Son of God is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. This is what differentiates the Christian faith from any other faith tradition. And this belief emerged very early on. You see in the bottom right there a fresco portrayal of Jesus as a uh, philosopher speaking in public. This is from an ancient catacomb underground in Rome, the catacomb of Priscilla. And this is from the second century AD, but as the, the hymn in the second chapter of Philippians shows, this belief that God emptied himself and became a human being emerged very early on. If not from the time of Jesus himself, then very early in the history of his community. Christians believe he was manifested in the flesh, that God showed himself not only through voices, through angels, through signs, but in human flesh. God appears to us in real human terms, as a real human being. He became truly man while remaining truly God. This is really the central claim about the incarnation that Christians profess. He was truly, meaning fully man, and yet remained truly and fully God. So even here, we're going a little bit beyond standard mathematical models, you know, where you have 100% of something, and if there's uh, two dimensions or two aspects to it, you have to divide up that 100% into lower percentages, right? 50% to 50%. But Christians believe that Jesus was 100% man and also 100% God. And that in assuming human form, he didn't have to sacrifice any of his divinity. And in becoming human, he became a true man, 100%. Okay, so there are many early Christian attempts to solve the mystery of the Incarnation. Like you would solve a Rubik's Cube. Thinking through this mystery is very difficult. And there's always a tension involved. You're pulled in one direction where you say, well, it doesn't matter if I understand it or not. Maybe it's un ununderstandable completely. And you could give in to pietism. And think, my reason has nothing to do with this. My reason has nowhere to grasp onto. Or you could lapse into rationalism, which most of the Christian heresies do to one degree or another, and say, well, if it's real, then I have to understand it completely. I have to solve the mystery. Well, notice that true mysteries are not something that readily reduce to solutions of this kind. Things that are unsolved and yet have a complete and total solution are usually called puzzles, right? We would call a Rubik's Cube a kind of puzzle because you can solve it and then you're done. Mystery novels are kind of like this, and so we get a kind of uh, misguided understanding of what mystery is. But a true mystery is like a personal identity. You can know something about it, but you never get to the point where you say, I've got it completely and totally figured out. The early Christian attempts to solve the mystery of the Incarnation in a way that reduces it to a puzzle that you can solve are called heresies. And this word is often uh, given a negative connotation. I'm sorry, this slide has uh, multiple typos. I apologize. Heresy is actually H-E-R-E-S-Y. Maybe I was thinking about chocolate, trying to spell Hershey or something. I don't know. 
But H-E-R-S-E-Y, heresy, comes from the Greek word hieresis, which means choice or system, it can even mean. And that's because heresies stem from our desire to understand the Incarnation completely. But their effect is to end up dissolving the mystery of the Incarnation. How? Well, when you solve a problem that you didn't uh, understand before, a light bulb goes on, right? You have a, an aha moment, something clicks. And then you see it for what it is, and it fits within your mode of thought. Well, this is characteristic of everything in the natural world, but it can't be something that's characteristic of a reality that exceeds, by definition, our human reason. And so heresies, in reducing the mystery of the Incarnation to a mere puzzle, ultimately imply that the Incarnation is fully knowable, and therefore a purely worldly phenomenon. Aha, I've got the Incarnation figured out. Okay, well, if you've got it figured out, then it's something within the world that you've gotten figured out. Kind of like that motto of St. Augustine, if you can comprehend it, it isn't God. Similarly with the Incarnation, if you've got it all figured out, if you've got the problem solved, then probably what you've got solved is not actually the real Incarnation. And in this way, heresies prioritize comprehension over mystery, explanation over presence. Now, there's an innumerable number of heresies that appear in the early church. So I won't go through all of those. We'll go into a little more detail next lecture about some of the figures and some of the history surrounding these early Christological controversies. But this lecture, I'm just going to try to outline five general categories of heresies. So just remember the primary Christian claim about the Incarnation is that God is fully 100% or rather, Jesus Christ is fully 100% human, but also fully 100% God. These categories, in one way or another, deny that central claim. So the first is perhaps the most obvious, the most straightforward. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is a human being. Hard to deny that, but Jesus Christ is not God. Uh, he looks like a human eats like a human, dies like a human. He's a human. And what evidence do we have that he's anything more? Well, maybe a few miracles here and there, but not enough to proclaim him to be God. Okay, well, there's some approaches to Jesus in this respect that still regard Jesus as a good human being, an exemplary human being. One of the earliest ones was Ebionism. This was a sect of Judaism, sort of a fringe group in Judaism uh, that were characterized by practices of extreme asceticism, prayer. They would often live apart from the world, uh, and they regarded Jesus as a exemplary teacher, but not God, similar to Islam. Islam regards Jesus as a prophet, a true prophet, but not one with God himself. So Jesus is not Allah. This is one of the principal characteristics of Islam that differentiates it from Christianity. Nevertheless, Jesus is admired, respected. In fact, every time the name of Jesus is said by devout Muslims, they add the tag, peace be upon him just like they do Muhammad. So they revere Jesus, but they do not regard him as God. But there are some ways of rejecting Jesus' divinity that do not regard him as exemplary, that say the fact that people proclaimed him to be God, and maybe he himself proclaimed himself to be God, this is a sign of somebody who should not be admired. And perhaps the chief example of this is Judaism. So rabbinic Judaism, which emerges uh, in the wake of uh, Jesus's life and death, will make claims and arguments that Jesus is not the Messiah, and to the extent that he or his followers claim him to be the Messiah, they should be outright rejected. And in general, Judaism does not hold up Jesus as 
a uh, worthy role model or a trusted teacher. There's no branch of Judaism, at least in its uh, traditional history, that is based upon the teachings of Jesus as a rabbi. Uh, mostly in Judaism, Jesus is regarded as a false messiah, somebody who uh, people thought was the messiah, but obviously wasn't. And so he's not held up as a role model, let alone God. And of course, if you deny the existence of God entirely, this is maybe a catch-all category here, then you're not going to think that Jesus is God. Now, some people along the way have denied the historicity of the person of Jesus Christ. This seems to be increasingly uh, discredited. Most people will at least recognize that somebody named Jesus Christ, who had followers, who lived in the first century, and who died through crucifixion, actually existed. But, uh, of course, if there is no God at all, then uh, Jesus would not be uh, one of the candidates for God. There is no God, so Jesus is not God. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so Jesus is human but not God. That's the first way of rejecting the church's teaching about the Incarnation. The second way is that Jesus is God but not really human. And this is maybe the reverse of the first one, right? So what we have before us is God himself but not a real or true human being. This was characteristic of a broad current of philosophy in the ancient world called Gnosticism. We get this uh, term from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the primary belief of Gnosticism was that matter is evil. Matter is evil, but spirit, that part of us that seems to transcend matter, is good. So there's a good dimension of the universe. There's an evil dimension of the universe. The evil dimension is characterized by matter and material things, things that pass away and change. Spirit, though, is characteristic of that part of the universe that is good, that is unchangeable, that is universal. Now, it had an interesting reading of the Bible based on this primary axiom, namely that the material world itself is evil and was made by what they called the Demiurge, the maker of the material world. And you'll see on the left there, a uh, Gnostic portrayal of this creature that they believed created the material universe. And he is not good, he is evil. Well, well, how, they would, how would they interpret Genesis 1, you might say? Uh, if the Lord, the God of Israel, created the whole world, and the world is evil because it's material, then would that make the Old Testament God evil? Well, the answer, of course, would be yes. It's oftentimes in Gnostic sects, particularly those that were closer to Christianity, you would have a very sharp distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is evil, is bad. He's the one who created this material world that we live in. The God of the New Testament, however, not the same God. He's more of a spiritual God. Uh, he's more of an immaterial God. And he appears in the guise of a human being uh, in order to redeem those who are trapped in the material world. And that means that we ourselves are kind of in a fundamental conflict with our bodies. We are spirits. We have something good within us but it's trapped within these material bodies and our bodies in turn are trapped by this material world. And so how do we get out? What is salvation for Gnostics? Salvation primarily consists in receiving secret knowledge. This is where that uh, term itself comes from. The gnosis, the knowledge that you receive about the true nature of things, about who you really are, who the, what this world is really like, and your relationship to it. This is the primary sacrament, you might say, of Gnostic sex. And, you know, it has some purchase insofar as it can be very easy to say, look at this world. Uh, why would anybody believe it's good? It's full of violence and viruses and earthquakes and disease. And, and it's very often tempting to think, oh, I don't belong here, right? Uh, this world is not truly my home. It's not where I belong. And so the Gnostics made the most of this. 
and insisted that salvation is really about liberation from the material world. And the primary way to do this is by receiving this knowledge about the nature of this uh, world, about the nature of your body. And this can liberate that part of you that is held captive to the material world. And so like a bird being released from its cage, this knowledge liberates you from the constraints of matter and your spirit is set free. Incidentally, a movie that really reflects this very uh, clearly is The Matrix. If any of you have seen the original version of The Matrix, it's really all about the discovery of the evil of the world, what they call The Matrix, and that this is a kind of liberation, right? When you take the pill that gives you the truth, it's not comfortable, but it provides you a way out of the exploitative and evil world in which you're trapped. Okay, so that's more of a catch-all category. One specific instance of Gnosticism that the Catechism mentions is a heresy called Docetism. Now, Docetism is just really the logical implication of Gnosticism when applied to Jesus. So if Jesus saves us by revealing the secret knowledge of the evil of the material world, but the goodness of our minds or that immaterial part of us that is to be liberated from the material world, it's a sign that there is a good God out there who wants to help you escape. The good God comes in Jesus to liberate our spirit from this evil material universe, and Jesus is the messenger. Or you might even say the good God himself who comes to us to give us the secret knowledge, but the implication here is that if it really is the true God who is appearing to us in Jesus to give us this secret knowledge, then his appearance as a human being can only be apparent. Jesus only appears to be human. He can't really be human. He can't really have anything to do with the evil of the material world. And so therefore his humanity is an illusion. It's like a hologram. It's a projection. And, of course, if God can do anything, God can appear just merely as a, a hologram or an illusion in order to communicate a message, right? And so this is what Jesus' humanity really is. It's just uh, an appearance. And the whole school of thought gets its name from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. So docetists were ones who thought that Jesus was a messenger from the good God who does grant salvation, but that he does so precisely in order to show us the evil of the material world and indeed our material human nature. And so he can't share in that nature. His humanity is really only a projection or an illusion. Okay, the third general pattern of these early Christian heresies is to affirm that Jesus is indeed the Word made flesh, the Son of God who became human, but that this word or son of God is, is not really the ultimate God. So it's really about what is the relationship between the son of God and God himself? What is the relationship between the word of God and God generally understood or what you might call the Godhead? The principal example of this comes from a heresy called Arianism which was promoted by a third, fourth century priest who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, and his name was Arius. See a little ancient picture of him on the right there, Arius of Alexandria. He was a, a priest, but he was very influential. And what he was trying to do was respond to accusations from others that Christians really believe in three gods that Christians really subscribe to tritheism. They believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They believe that there are three gods, and so therefore there are polytheists. They have a pantheon of gods. It's just uh, rather intimate, just three. And what he's trying to do is to preserve the unity and transcendence of God in response to these accusations. So there is only one God, and this God is ultimate and transcendent, and... Christians do not believe in three different gods, but only one God. 
And so therefore the word of God or the son of God is not really fully, truly God. And he uses scripture very persuasively. He knew scripture very well, and he brought it to bear on this argument very effectively. So for instance, in the first chapter of the book of Colossians, St. Paul writes that Christ was the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. Hmm, what does that suggest? Well, if he's the firstborn of all creation, then he's part of creation, right? He himself was created. God the Son is the first and highest creature. This is really the central claim of Arianism that differentiates it from the Orthodox Christian understanding of the Incarnation. The Son of God or the Word of God was the first thing that God created. And the Creed itself seems to reflect this. Right? The Father begets the Son. Why else call him a Father, right? And so the Father comes first. And the Son comes after the Father, right? That's the way it usually goes. So Arius would write, He that was begotten had a beginning of existence. And therefore there was a time when the Son was not. So there is a universal, eternal God. And the Son of God comes into existence at a point in time because the Father begets or brings into existence the Son. See, he's thinking of it in temporal terms here. And furthermore, he says, just like all things, just like all creation, God brought forth the Son out of nothing. He came to be from things that were not. So even though he is the first, highest, and most exalted of all creatures, God the Son is nevertheless a creature. And this means, incidentally, that the Son is subordinate to the Father, but also of a different essence or substance than the Father. The Son is from another substance. He is essentially or substantially different in nature from God the Father. So the Father and the Son do not share the same essence, according to Arius. Arianism had a huge influence at this period of time. It attracted many Christian believers. There were Arian churches all over the place. Even a few of the emperors of the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, subscribed to this view. Uh, and it was a very pervasive and long-lasting heresy in the early Christian church. Okay, the fourth pattern of heresies follows uh, this line of thought. God the Son attaches or links himself to the humanity of Jesus. There are really two different expressions of this, primarily. One is adoptionism, and it begins with the somewhat intuitive observation that a baby, a little infant, can't really be God, right? A baby's helpless. A baby doesn't know anything. It's, it's, it's little more than a self-sustaining biological organism, right? It has nothing in it that you could possibly identify as divine, right? This was the tendency or intuition of adoptionism. This is where it starts. And so then it presumes, well, if the baby Jesus can't really be God, then the Son of God must adopt the human person Jesus at some point in his life in order to act through him. So we have a picture here of, you might say, the divine uh, substrate or infrastructure of the Incarnation being brought into the world through Mary in the ordinary human way. Some adoptionists, by the way, thought uh, that the virgin birth was true. Some didn't. It didn't really matter. But like whatever baby came forth from Mary, however it was conceived, was fully human. And at some point in the life of this human being, God takes over. God the Son unites himself with this human person and sort of like a puppeteer controls a puppet, acts through this human being. So the word of God becomes flesh at some point in Jesus' life. Well, when? Well, the primary candidate that emerges is Jesus' baptism. Why? Well, first of all, Jesus was fully grown, right? So he had a, a mind, self-awareness, uh, the ability to think, relate, pray, etc., but more than that, the, the, the account of the baptism in the Gospels has God's own voice proclaim after Jesus emerges from the water. This is my beloved son. So it's at that moment that Jesus declares 
that the human person Jesus is his son. So many adoptionists thought it was at that moment that the Son of God enters into the human person Jesus, unites himself to the human nature of Jesus, and then acts through that human nature and accomplishes our salvation. Okay. The other primary expression of this particular view is Nestorianism, and this was promoted by this uh, bishop of Constantinople named Nestorius. He lived in the late 4th and mostly in the 5th century. He was the bishop of Constantinople, so he was a big deal. He was the patriarch of the Eastern Christian world. Very powerful, very influential. And he thought that Jesus Christ was a human person, and he was also a divine person, so he doesn't really reject the fully human, fully divine on its face, but he says that the human person is somehow joined to the divine person of God's Son. So what he would assert is that the Incarnation involves two persons, each with their own nature, that are somehow joined or linked together. The human person, Jesus, the divine person of the Son of God, get glued together or linked somehow. It's unclear whether he would have rejected adoptionism or not. He probably would have. But he nevertheless had the underlying theological uh, belief that the two persons united through some conjunction that also then implies conveniently for many that they could decouple or unlink from each other. Many adoptionists and Nestorianists thought that when Jesus suffered and died on the cross, that it was only his human nature, it was only the human person who suffered. And because God can't really suffer, because God really can't endure uh, damage or death, then God uh, separated from the human person and was nice and comfortable up in heaven and was sort of looking down at the human person, Jesus suffering. And only at the resurrection did he join back up again with the human person. So this view asserts that God links up with human nature somehow. And so notice the implication. If you can decouple or unlink yourself from Jesus' humanity, to what extent do you really fully assume that humanity? Or are you just sort of a temporary tenant in that humanity, using Jesus like a rental tool for a while, and then abandoning him for a while, coming back, the idea that this is just merely a linkage or a conjunction is the problem with this pattern of thought about the Incarnation. Okay, the other problem is that it really introduces a kind of schizophrenia into Jesus, a little like a personality disorder. If you met a person and they said, um, I'm not just one person, I'm actually two persons. I have a human person inside me and a divine person inside me. And then you would naturally ask the question, okay, well, which one am I talking to at the moment, right? Uh, so how is it that you can have two persons always sort of interacting with each other, <clears throat> acting through the same uh, human being in time? Is it like a dance? Are they holding hands? Uh, it introduces a kind of duality or, or dual personality in Jesus that also is problematic. The final pattern of these heresies is the opposite of adoptionism and Nestorianism in a certain sense. And it's that Jesus Christ is a mere mixture of God and humanity. And this really gets put under the broad umbrella of what's called monophysitism. It's a tough word to say. If you believe in this heresy, you are a monophysite. And there are even still today some monophysite churches in uh, Central Asia, Armenia, Iraq, and Iran. And they believe in what uh, this figure, Eutyches of Constantinople, taught, again in the late 4th, early 5th centuries, that the divine word and the human being, Jesus, combine to form a single new being. So what does that possibly mean? Well, you have a human nature and a divine nature, and they become perfectly one. But in order to become perfectly one, they create a new sui generis, unique nature. So God merges with a human being to form a single person with a single new nature, that of the God-man. So Jesus, this, this emphasizes Jesus' uniqueness, right? He is the only one in whom human nature and divine nature have 
merged, have combined to create uh, something new in the world. And the word itself comes from these two Greek words, mono meaning one and husus meaning nature, it refers to the central claim here that Jesus has one nature. It's a combination or a mixture of human and divine. Now, notice this solves the problem of Christ's schizophrenia, right? So we don't have a dual personality anymore. We don't have a divine person interacting with a human person. But at what cost? Well, the primary cost is that this makes Jesus Christ into a hybrid, like a centaur, as I talked to you about before in last lecture. And if you combine two natures in this way to make a new nature, what you have here is really neither completely one nature nor the other nature, but a hybrid, a mixture of the two, in the way that a centaur is not entirely human, but also not entirely horse. He's maybe half human, half horse, right? And so this is how this fifth pattern contradicts the Christian view, because we can no longer really fully say Jesus is 100% human and 100% God. He's somehow a new, unique mixture of the two. Okay, so in light of these patterns, what basic solutions do Christians offer? Well, the first comes in 325 AD, fairly early on, at the Council of Nicaea. And Nicaea is where we get the creed that Catholics profess at every Mass, that Jesus Christ is true God from true God. Light from light, begotten, not made. What does that mean? Well, it means that in, in being begotten from the Father, the Son is no less God than the Father. What we have here is a procession of true God from true God, and that the Son of God is one in essence with the Father. So Jesus is just as much God as the Father. Notice here the implicit rejection of Arianism. That's the primary target of the Council of Nicaea to reject Arianism. And Arius was there, in fact. We'll talk about that more next lecture. It gets kind of spicy, actually. Arius was there and tried to promote his view that the Son was a creature, that he was something less than God, something other than God. The Council ultimately rejects that, emphatically saying that the Son of God is indeed fully, truly God. One in essence with the Father, or as we say now, consubstantial, one in being with the Father. The second solution comes at the Council of Ephesus, about 100 years later, in 431 AD, and is primarily targeted at the Adoptionists and the Nestorians, those who hold the linkage or attachment view of divinity and humanity, and it does it in a unique way. It doesn't really talk so much about Jesus as about Mary. But the implications are clear. The Council of Ephesus proclaims that Mary is truly the mother of God, the Theotokos, which means the bearer of God. That almost seems like mythological talk, right? But what is meant here is that the child that Mary bore, the child of whom she was the mother, is indeed truly and fully God. And so therefore, baby Jesus was just as much God as adult Jesus, right? No adoption, no uh, possibility of decoupling or unattaching Jesus' divinity and humanity. Jesus was fully God from the moment of his conception. The child that Mary conceived in her womb was fully and completely God. <clears throat> Finally, we have the Council of Chalcedon. And this, in a way, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, this should be uh, 451. <clears throat> sorry about that. Council of Chalcedon takes place in the year 451. And this is really the end of these early Christological controversies. We have a kind of definitive statement, as we'll see next lecture, about the relationship of Jesus' divinity and humanity. And it states that Jesus Christ is not two natures and two persons, nor is Jesus Christ one nature and one person, like the Monophysites would have it. Jesus Christ is two natures, but one person. So we have a distinction of the humanity and divinity. We have fully human and fully God in Jesus. And yet it's only one person who acts. And these two natures are complete and intact in themselves, but nevertheless perfectly united. Okay, we'll talk more about these details in the next lecture. 
And you have to read for that lecture chapter 8 of Mark Zia's uh, book, The Faith Understood, all about the Incarnation. And we'll get into a little more of the historical details about these councils and the figures behind them in that lecture. So until then, have a great day. And I will post these slides in this lecture very soon. Okay, take care. God bless.